the concept here was to find a conversation partner at uh, the end of this first day, looking at Minnesota issues, looking at the, the national uh, perspective of these things, to just sort of talk about whether, whether we're, you know, jousting with windmills or is there, is there a real possibility of getting out of this struggle of uh, the assault on free speech and and but doing it in a kind of bipartisan objective above the above the fray manner and so lucky enough to have mike burbach doing this with us we actually altered the title a little bit a few days ago to say can the media take on some of this responsibility of uh trying to create a bipartisan conversation and a calm conversation about speech uh, and its freedom in this country. And can it help people like Jane Kirtley and me resolve our one particular difference? Um, so that's the, the sort of uh, difficult mandate that I've handed us. And I want to know what you think about that, Mike. Well, thank you. I, I, I have a lot. I think a lot about that. <clears throat> and I think the short answer is yes, there is something we can do. Um, be the change. Consider what, what we can do. Everybody has an opinion about what everybody else should do. Yes. You know, you should, you should, you should. So I love a conversation, whoever we is, I love a conversation that begins with the premise what can we do? So I would, I would take counsel from the sum, some of the key, pe key, key messages from this afternoon's conversation, the panels we've listened to about the state of free speech, um, about protests, all of this. There were some really key points, I think, that various people made along the way that I think can guide us on this question of can we do something and what should we do? Among them are my words, you can't set it and forget it. You know, we've got these ideas, we have these rights, we have these documents, we have these principles, but anybody who thinks we ever had them, that they were on and safe just doesn't know. We've always had to fight for things. It's the nature of mm -hmm. self-governance. It's the nature of, of a desire for freedom. It's a, the nature of a de desire for equal before the law. We've always had to fight. We have to fight now. Is it worse now than ever before? I don't know. I don't think so. But when the when you bring so th that idea to bear on the question of what can we do about it, what how can the media help? Um, I think that we're thinking about some of the some of the some of the basic things about our alleged ideals, about the ideals we they're not just alleged, but the ideal ideals that we say we believe in. We want to be fair. We want to be right. We want to be interested. So some of the things we can do include being more interested, being more curious, trying to understand, as several people alluded to, the various complexities of any of these issues, any given story. One of the things I say to our interns, we have interns who come in every year, I meet with each of them to get to know, know them a little bit. Uh, and to give them some advice about how to get the most out of their time with us at the Brighton Press. One of the things I say is you need to be humble and confident. Humble because no matter how long you spend on it, you will never have the whole story. Yep. Leave room for what you don't know. Confident in the idea that what you do know is useful. 
So the, the shorter way to say that is one of the things we can do is listen better to all of our sources about everything. You know, we, we wring our hands as a country, we wring our hands as media, pundits, whatever, about this polarization and the division and all of that, and that, that's, that's fine, we should. But I don't know how often we stop and think, well, what should I do about that? What can I do in my life about that? And there's a lot we can do. So that's a long answer to your question. No, that's all right. I'd like to hear some of your specific suggestions. Dr. Wilson here, in, in some of his remarks, <clears throat> challenged us to, to challenged us with the idea that obvious maybe, but not everybody's experience is the same, right? The, the narrative of America looks different depending on who you are and where you are. where you've been and what recourse or what stake you may think you have. So among the specific things we can do are making sure that we bend our minds with ideas like that. You know, it, it's easy it's easy to say, well, I know nobody's ex that not everybody's experience is the same. But what do you know about it? What do I know about it? How do I find that out? We can we can very specifically go listen to people who we know we disagree with, yep. for example, and listen to learn, not listen to rebut. That's something specific. Um, another thing that we can do is resist the spin. I think of it as like 360 degrees of constructive skepticism. Everybody we deal with, particularly in government, but everybody else, they're all spinning. Human, it's a human thing. I want to persuade you that, I, that I'm right, you know, so I'm going to spin you. How do we resist the spin? Well, we question the premise. So you say you want to rezone the riverfront, for example, uh, and you're just you're having an argument, the city and the county are having an argument about how to rezone the riverfront. And we get so caught up in the day to day about the back and forth on the particulars of rezoning the riverfront that over time we forget to say, wait a minute, what's the point of this? You know, the, the litigation, figuratively speaking, becomes the point. And we forget to go back and say, well, what's the thing we're trying to do by rezoning the riverfront? What's the aim? And so I think we can, we can make sure that we listen. Number one, we can make sure we listen to people who, whose experience is different from our own and from the people we normally talk to. We can question the premise of various things. So we say we want to do this thing to feed feed all the children. Okay, so let's go, let's back up and say, which children and how do you know they're hungry? We know they're out there, but how do we know? And do we really try hard to find out? And did we really try hard to find out? Yeah. You know, I'm telling a little story of myself. I had an experience the other day. I wouldn't have imagined this coming up here, but I was uh, driving in DC and uh, of course I used to work for public radio, so I always l listened to public radio and it was pledge time. And um, I don't need to listen to that because I'm fully aware of the need to fund public, <laughs> public radio and to be funded. And so I, one of the rare times I changed the station and on my particular car, I push the up button and it takes me to the Pacifica station in Washington. There are only a few of them in the country, but there's a pretty vibrant one in Washington. Some of us get very tired of it, it's tedious. But I tuned in totally fortuitously and accidentally to a conversation about China and about someone raising the question, why are we entering into a new Cold War with China? And why 
in this particular case, not surprising coming from Pacifica. Why is the New York Times trying to beat the drum to stir up the Cold War with China? And I start, I just started to think about it. And I said, well, you know, wait a minute. There is a sort of presumption that our big enemy of the moment is China, but says who? And on the basis of which evidence? I mean, and the evidence that they want Taiwan, well, is it surprising they want Taiwan? No. Would it be a good thing if they took Taiwan? Probably not. But why are they so, it, it is as if, if you really want to be a good American now in all those classic definitions, you've got to, you've got to be not just skeptical of China, but really talking trash mm -hmm. about China. And as a person, as somebody in the media, as an academic, I mean, all sorts of categories. And there are investigations going on of people, maybe they need to be, but people who've had some affiliation with, it's extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And very little gets reported. And, and so, um, I, I think I think you've touched on something very important, this question of listening to dissenting views or listening to minority views, listening to some other questions about how how does it feel when you're someone else or you're someplace else on the on the ethnic spectrum or the religious spectrum or something like that. Or the the generally speaking, the experience spectrum. Yes. You know. And and very often it comes with, it it gets described as well special pleading, right? You know, well those people are just arguing for themselves or just you know trying to get some rhetorical advantage or, or, or something. And uh, but it's self examination is not the strong suit of the American media. Mm -hmm despite all the official ombuds people and at one stage and internal public editors and so on, most of which have now been most done away been, with. Yeah. I think you hit the nail on the head when you said, <clears throat> says who? Yeah. You know, if we, if we get better at asking that question, says who? In all its iterations, right. we can begin to we can begin to figure things out. I know how to say it to my students. Mm -hmm. but, says who? <laughs> but not necessarily peers. The, the, the thing that I see, uh, everybody sees it um, so often, is has to do with the myriad ways in which we tell each other to shut up. You know, they're, they're, we've got all these reflexes that are meant to say, shut up and some of them we mean you know very much like that shut up and some of them it's the sometimes it's just the 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 quest for advantage too mm -hmm. you know and journalists we do this and i hate it that we do it but we do we have ways in print of raising our eyebrow Plaus plausibly deniable but we raise our eyebrow oh, you bet. adjectives adverbs we, we don't, as much as we, we used to, attempt to hide behind this idea of objectivity, which is a myth. Objectivity is a human impossibility. The pursuit of it is useful, but we can't do it, you know? Huh? Sure, it's a commercial construct. That's right. And it's, and it's, and it's a delusion, and it, and, it, and it hurts us because it... It prevents us from saying, oh, I decided to ask that question because I've got a lot of biases. You know, biases aren't necessarily good or bad. They just are they what are. we're walk bun walking bundles of. But I asked that question and not that one because I've got these assumptions and these presumptions. And, I, and I, it's been my experience. Well, that's not objective. It might be fair. It might be good. Uh, we should probably ask that question. It may even be understandable, but it's yeah, not. Yeah, sure, but it's not objective. Yeah. And so I think that that part part of the 
part of the trick for us is to acknowledge that it's nothing to be ashamed of any more than you're ashamed of the idea that, you know, your hair turns gray. It just does. It's a lot. That, that train <laughs> left the station. That train left the station. It's just, it's just humanness. But if we want to understand things, we have to take a step back from our own selves and including this, this notion that we have superpowers, you know, we don't, we don't, but we can be more interested, we can be more curious, we can ask how come, we can ask who says, we can ask, we can ask uh, how did you come to that conclusion? You know, that's hard to do and you and I were talking the other day about the difference maybe between Washington and <laughs> other places, yes. you know, and it's hard to do when you're in the spin cycle, which you are in in Washington, 24 seven, 25 seven, whatever. Uh, it's hard to do that moment to moment. And I don't, I don't know how to do that in DC. You know, here I can listen better. I can go find people and I do who know things that I don't know and that means everybody. Uh, and and try harder to listen and understand where they came from. And journalists can do that. You know, the the the. I like to think that that investigative journalism might be one good question. Oh sure. You know, it might be just one good question that you work and work and work. It's a lot of things, but we can do that. We can ask better questions with that intention and it's hard to do you know I, I joke that we used to be a daily and now we're a minutely <laughs> oh uh, nobody reads the newspaper right to find out what happened yesterday no no and so you're 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 always hustling you gotta yeah. you gotta publish etc cetera, etc cetera. and so it it takes intention to take a step back and say what do I understand why do I think I understand that what should I ask next and what should I keep asking but I think if we do that, we can go some little distance in some little increment, you know, multiplied by hundreds, thousands, toward um, addressing what may be a free speech crisis. I, I agree with Jane Kirtley that we are, that I don't know that this is more of a crisis than any other time of crisis. But it's a time of concern for sure. And if we do, if we act with intention and interest on those kinds of things, we can do a little bit toward that. And if, if over time people say, no, they were really interested in me. And not only that, yeah. they listened. That adds up over time. I mean, every local news organization, and the national ones too, every, every local news organization knows that Everything is built on a relationship, and a relationship, whether it's you know your news business or your family, it's it's built on this idea that somebody cares about you, and they're going to list, they're going to care enough to listen to you, and that takes bit by bit by bit. You know, my friend Mike Jacobs in Grand Forks used to say, "Ascent is glacial, and decline is volcanic," which is true. You can lose it all in a minute, yeah. but you got to step it up. So I think I think those things can help. They just we have to do it on purpose and it's hard. Yeah, and it seems at the moment as if um, somebody has to blow a whistle, not in the sense of a whistleblower, <laughs> but somebody has to has to say stop. Let's approach some of these things a little differently. Yeah. Let's um, give more credence to a a dissenting view, not because it's an impossible, you know, we know it's not going to be taken seriously, but because maybe it needs to be taken mm -hmm. seriously. And it's probably interesting, yes. besides. Probably is. Yeah. Yeah, I think of this coverage of the country's, you know, the threat that the government's going to shut down, that the faith and credit of the United States is going to, um, and of course when you in Washington, it's it it it's just unrelenting, yes. and it, here we go again. You know, ten days left this time, or what? I think it is just about ten days left until the end of the 
fiscal year this time. And it's, I mean, I swear you could take out the news stories from the last time and just run them again. Nobody would notice. Right. I think you're right. I think you're right. And uh, so why does this really happen? And what, you know, what aren't we reporting? What, what aren't we saying about these things? It's well, I think it's easy to get caught up in a moment. Yep. You know, it's easy to get caught up in a moment and it's easy. I was thinking about this during the, the panels this afternoon too. Um, what do they tell you if you're suddenly in trouble in the water? Don't panic. Right. If you panic, you're going to gulp water and choke. And I think it's, but it's, but every every ounce of your being says panic, panic. And we get in these moments where <laughs> and we get offended. I'm not an enemy of the people. I'm a friend of the people. You know, we get offended and we panic, and and then it's easy to lose sight of what you learned in swimming lessons. And so I think that among the things we do is recommit to the basic ideals of what we learned as journalists, not objectivity, but interest, fairness, ask another question. You know, the, the adage used to be, if your mother says she loves you, check it out. It's, st <laughs> it's still a good adage, you know, but I think of it as 360 degrees of constructive skepticism yeah. now. It's, um, and it becomes very easy not to, not to ask the people who are really affected by things. I mean. Right. Right, because the people who, the, 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 you know, the production process favors the same old thing. Yep. The production process favors <laughs> boringness. It, it disfavors hard questions. It disfavors complexity. And that's bad news, you know? I mean, you gotta, you gotta get this thing done. When tomorrow's another day, what, anybody's production process does this. So how do we not do the same old thing? Yeah. One thing that we can do is quit disparaging the American people. You know, yes. there's a tendency to want to say, well, they're not interested in this. They don't have an attention span. All they want to do is yap on social media. There's some truth to that. But, uh, you know, Neil, I don't know if you would say this or my other colleagues in, in media, but, but what the digital metrics tell us, by and large, you know, the measure of what people read, the measure of what they read next, the measure of how they spend their time, they want everything that we want them to want. They want us to dig. They want us to get it right. They want us to be fair. They want us to respect their intelligence. They want us to respect their ability to decide for themselves. You know, you do that, they'll click on it, and they'll be glad they clicked, which is the key. Yep. So I think that's one of the things we can do is, is you know, respect our fellow residents and citizens more and quit quit taking that easy out you know it's it, it, it's not them you know it might be us that's the problem well that's certainly true and uh and to pay more attention to what the audience is really interested in what it's worried about what it's really worried about yes um and I, I think that some of these stories, these recurring stories, have long since abandoned those, those yes, questions. Yes, for sure. I mean, what really does happen if the government, uh, you know, will Fitch downgrade the United States credit rating? Well, that's sort of an interesting question. But what about people who are, what about child poverty mm -hmm. and the people who are reliant on food stamps? What will happen to them mm -hmm. if the government shuts down or if there's a real crisis? And I don't understand. It. I mean, I'm not in the daily news business anymore. And by and large, I'm glad I'm not. But why, why not think harder about 
less obvious questions, but they're really much more important questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the horse race in in all these things gets to be real boring and real meaningless real fast. Yep. Whether it's, you know, is this this thing gonna happen, that thing gonna happen, this person gonna win, that person gonna win. It, it's it's it, but but it but it reinforces itself because the people we talk to are get fired up about it, you know, and so then we get fired up about it. We know they always want to talk about it, so we go back to them. But it's boring and it means nothing. Yeah. We had a we had a uh, in Minnesota this past year we had a historically large budget surplus, eighteen I, billion dollars or so, and so the legislature had to figure out what to do about it. And there was talk early on about giving some of it back, giving all of it back, giving some of it back to the taxpayers <clears throat> or figuring something else out. And the legislative session goes on and it spins and it spins and everybody gets caught up in the next turn of the screw. And so at a certain point I said, okay, here's what we gotta do. Just ask, are you gonna give the money back? Just ask that question. Don't let them say, well, it's complicated. Just ask that question. I don't care what the answer is. I don't care if they give the money back or not. But you got to ask the plain question and you got to stick to it. We finally did that. We finally did that. And it turned out that that's what people, <laughs> it's one of the things that people were interested in. They yeah. had all kinds of different opinions sure. about what should happen with it. Should they give it back? Should they, whatever. I don't care. But. <laughs> If when we're trying to get to the question of the effects of the shutdown or the effect on child poverty, we have to we have to be smart enough to make the question that we're asking that we believe people care about apparent. They got to be able to see that we're asking this question, and if you bury it in, you know two tons of back and forth and four tons of numbers that don't mean anything outside of a very specific context that two people have, they're not going to see their question. And they're not going to think that whatever we did is relevant. We, they're not going to think we're for them. And they're so not going to think anyone's them. working in good faith on this issue. They're not. Yeah. They're not. They're not. I have a friend in Washington who has... Uh, He's, he's a retired person who had a tremendous amount of influence on elections and campaign. He was a pollster, and, and he's now retired. And he, uh, he believes, purports to believe, I think he does, that when next year rolls around, neither Joe Biden nor Donald Trump will be on the ballot hmm. for president. What a shocking thing. And... And uh, people are shocked by it because they haven't, no one else has raised that proposition. It's, uh, the, the reporting is so utterly predictable. Is Biden too old or not? Is Trump going to get convicted or not? And, and, you know, and of course, coverage of Trump is, it's unbelievable how everybody sustains so much coverage of, of Trump. But, even, I mean, political coverage, which is what our colleagues like most of all, even though the public might not, even in political coverage, there are no, no interesting questions mm -hmm. being asked. Mm -hmm. Really, virtually none. Yeah. What a, what a waste. <laughs> the, the, to, to switch back a little bit toward the, the motivating question for this symposium, you know, free speech and the free speech movement. Um, there's there's a futurist here. I think she's moved, uh, Trista Harris, uh, who worked in nonprofits and has written a book and and has an organization called Future Good. And we had a meeting. The little group I'm in had a meeting with with her, and then I read the book. And the the key message that I took from that was make sure that you're organized around the good thing that you want, which makes a lot of sense to me. So 
the good thing that we want is not necessarily just free speech, right? We want free speech because it's a mechanism toward the good thing we want. I hear where you're going, yeah. And I think what happens, and that what we can do better at along the way, is what we can do better at preventing along the way is what happens is a lot of litigation about a lot of details so that there's a blizzard and we can't see the good thing we want. And then we just get organized around the fight <clears throat> of whatever the detail that we're worked up about is. So what's, what's the point of free speech? What, what's the point of the various amendments? You know, I think we can do better at, at working those things, at working those questions, I think. Yeah, I, I agree. Let's see if anybody has any, anything that they want to add. Kevin? Oh, here, we have microphones galore. <laughs> Okay. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to ask you to puncture my, my uh, thesis here because I'm not sure I agree with it myself, but the idea of objectivity as I understand it when it was first formulated was, was a commercial prospect. It was uh, the Associated Press needed to sell news all over the nation. In a lot of ways, that meant whitewashing, lynchings, and everything like that. So what came before that? The Colonial Press was a completely partisan press operation there were, and according to the legend, and I have no way of verifying this, and I don't know if it's true or not, readers read all kinds of different newspapers. And of course, they did have more time. They didn't have the <laughs> distractions of television and radio and, and forums like this one, um, that they were taking in these different things, that they were taking in more points of view. Um, is that a possible answer? A return to a colonial style of press where we say, go ahead, be as partisan as you want. Or is that not possible because we don't have an audience that has the, the ability to take in all those different points of view or the willingness or the capacity, et cetera, et cetera? How do you, how do you take that on? I think we have it. You know, the, 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 I like to think of, it's been going on a long time now, but the digital revolution, the internet revolution, all of that, you think of it as an explosion of freedom which it absolutely is. You know, you used to have a, you used to need a hundred million bucks to be a publisher. <laughs> Buy a press, hire a bunch of people, do some stuff. Now you get a secondhand phone and you're a publisher. You don't automatically have an audience, but you're a publisher. So it's an explosion of freedom that is a good thing because freedom's a good thing, but explosions blow things up. It blew up our business model, that's for sure. It also blew up, um, for good and for ill, absolutely both, our sense of ourselves. You know, the, the, the example of the videos from the murder of George Floyd. There's a whole lot of people in our country who were not surprised about that. There's some who were, you know, because they didn't think that's what we did here. But the profusion of voices, of opinions, of truths, you know, same set of facts, many truths, gives us more of what you're talking of what, what it may have been like in the early days when every town had, you know, every town of any size had 10 newspapers or something and pamphleteers and all this. So we have that. Um, but this explosion of freedom also blew up other stuff too. You know, it blew up our sense of of what are we organized around. It blew up our sense of who can we trust and who can't we. And we found out that you can't trust anybody to have the whole story. You can't, because nobody does. So, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, you could say that the cable channels have done that. You know, they've gone all partisan, what few of them there are. Um, I don't know if mainstream newspapers do that or not. Um, it, it's not, you know, I guess I'm not, I'm not that interested in it myself, you know, because I'm interested in an explore and explain approach to the news. Um, but 
There's lots of ways to do this. I don't know if that even addresses your question. <laughs> Mike, by, by the way, what what was the what was the impact, you suppose, of the fact that the most popular of those cable channels was had no pretension of being quote unquote objective or that that was such a successful profitable model <laughs> to turn journalism on its head into propaganda, yep. which is what Fox News did, really. Mm -hmm. And, well, it's less, they've been prevented from doing it by their own overreach in certain ways now. But what does that do for trust in, in journalism? Well, they had followers. Yeah, they sure did. They had imitators. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. MSNBC and CNN went that way. Not not as sort of. not not as much as Fox, yeah. you know, not as much. But this is I'm exaggerating a little bit. But I I don't feel the need to look at any of them because I know what they're gonna say. You know, I, they all have they all have some value. There are good reporters at all of them. But why do I want to look at something that I already know what they're gonna say? You know, so I think part of that. The, the impact of that was entertainment, I guess. Um, and, and the marketplace for news, like the marketplace for cars, like the marketplace for cell phones is dynamic. And it doesn't always behave in the way that we expect or want. But you gotta have some faith in the American people. You know, you gotta have some faith that there are some good ideas at the core, and over time, people want to be able to trust, you know, and, and this explosion of freedom, which blew up all kinds of things, maybe it's starting to settle, I don't know, you know, I'd be curious in Jim, uh, Jim Brady's take on some of this. He's in the, you know, he's been in the absolute thick of all of it from different angles. Uh, and Knight has been trying to figure this out for a long time and is now in different ways. Uh, so I guess I'd be, there are people who know a lot about this and yeah. Jim's one of them. What do you think, Jim? <laughs> oh, no. oh, I hope she's okay. Good. Okay, I'll let, you off. I'll let you off the hook. We'll let you off the hook. Good. Okay. Yeah, of course. Here, here comes the microphone from behind. Okay. You know, I, I grew up in journalism school in the era where I was taught that objectivity was the key, and so I'm still having trouble giving up on that. But it seems to me that, that maybe the word we might be looking for rather than objectivity is independence in the sense that we put the reader first always. Mike, I have in my office um, the Pioneer Press Bulldog that used to be one of the Pioneer Press's things. And he sits there and gathers dust, but I love to look at him. And I forget exactly what the motto was, but it was something along the lines of, we will fight for you or we have your back, or I forget, I don't know, maybe you know what it was. But I wonder if the reason that Fox resonated with as many people as it did is because they thought that the other mainstream media did not have their back, that the mainstream media had their own agenda, that they liked to stir the pot for the fun of it, that they liked to report the horse race, and what did that have to do with me? But, the, but Fox, whether rightly, wrongly, correctly, or it was a lie, position themselves as we are your champions. We will tell you what the other folks won't tell you. We are going to you know, look at the seamy underbelly of the Washington deep state, things like that. So perhaps might some of the answer be independence, but independence that is positioned to say, I'm here to fight for my readers, for my viewer. That's my highest priority, and the devil take the hindmost otherwise. Just a thought. deal with this a lot. The thing about objectivity that's fascinating to me is that there are 
for a while, almost every panel or almost every conference would have a debate about objectivity. And the thing that I always found so fascinating was after the debate, you realized that the person all the way over on this side and the person all the way over on this side agreed on 85% of what journalism is. <laughs> the fair, accurate, was, you know, the, 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 so they were, the, the, these things would always start as this pitched battle between two completely opposing sides, and then you'd watch it, and it was like, a, it was really no, there wasn't much of a difference. There was really, do I bring my lived experience to journalism versus do I not bring my lived experience to journalism? But most of the most of the rest of the debate was pretty benign in the sense that there wasn't a who's going to argue with fairness and accuracy and so to me object the objectivity discussion gets to be one of those things that feels like we spend a lot of time talking about but the battle is over a very small sliver of it. It's I think I th personally think it's a bit of an over overrated battle because I don't think people are that separate that that divided on it. I think there's always been a partisan press. There'll always be a partisan press. None of that's going to change. On the Fox, on the Fox side of things, I do think there's a, a research, a piece of data that is probably explains some of Fox's popularity, which I think I can't remember exactly what year it is, but I think it's a Gallup poll that 30 years ago, when journalists were asked what political party they anonymously, of course, but like asked what political party they were a part of, I think it was like 62% said Democratic Party, 38% Republican, and that research was redone a couple of years ago. It was 88, 12. So there has been a shift in journalism to far more, far more liberal, a far more liberal profession. And at the same time, I think what's happened is the layer of editing that used to be there to sort of try to weed out, okay, if this person puts their opinion in, it's going to go through four editors, and some of that will get pulled out. You now have people publishing most of their work without editing at all, if you count social media. If you talk about people who go on television or radio hits, they're not going through any editing. And so now you have a, you have a profession that has gotten more liberal in terms of who, who does the work combined with fewer editing layers, I think, to sort of enforce that, whether you think it's the right thing to enforce or not, but enforce that objectivity piece. So I do think Fox was sort of a response to that, a, a rise of like a sense that there wasn't somebody on, there wasn't somebody who had the back of the actual conservatives. And so they spoke to that and they spoke to it kind of, again, in ways that a lot of us might not find that productive, but they certainly, from a business perspective, did it pretty well. So there is still, that is certainly something we see in a lot of the polling is the distrust of, and one more thing I'll say, when you go back 25, it was really 2002 actually, right around the Iraq war, the difference between Republicans and Democrats trusting the media was not very big at all. It was five or 6% and that gap is now like 60. So like you can ask yourself the question of, is it because conservatives in this country have just lost, you know, like they, that's their fault or do we have to own some responsibility for why that gap has opened up? And I think there's a lot of data out there that suggests they do feel left behind, conservatives do feel left behind by local, by media, probably more national than local, but I think they certainly do feel left behind by national media and the data is pretty clear on that. So I think Fox has, has taken advantage of that. Neil? Thanks. Uh, I love uh, this conversation because uh, I think it's important. I think it's noble and I think it's ambitious. And I do wonder if it's a waste of time. Uh, we do spend a lot of time beating ourselves up about what we're doing, what we're not doing. But I'm more and more thinking that it's not our fault. People have made a choice. Um, we hear a lot of talk about Fox News, why it's successful and, and reaching the people who felt disenfranchised. I also think Fox has been successful because it's entertaining. I mean, they introduced, for better or worse, very attractive women in short skirts very early on. They got very good broadcasters. Whatever you think of his opinion, Bill O'Reilly was a fantastic broadcaster. They make the news, not news, they make their commentaries fun and exciting. They're not, you know, you don't feel like it's a um, noble lecture. It's fun to watch Fox, especially if you come from a certain ilk. Um, I don't know how we can fight that. You know, we've been around long enough to remember focus groups. Those who are older remember newspapers would have focus groups come in and you'd ask them what they want in the paper and they'd tell you, oh, we want more stories on international news. We want more think pieces. <laughs> we want more zoning board. And you kind of suspected that was bullshit. Uh, because they really believe that, right? They really want to believe that their top prior priority wasn't lighter news. What we now know from the digital numbers, 
what they really read. Local TV figured it out. They always had ratings. I think they figured it out before we did. What's the number one thing in local TV that's doing pretty well? The weather, proportionately, right? Um, that's not our fault, necessarily. And I just wonder if we're setting ourselves up, beating ourselves up on something, at least right now, we can't, we can't win. I mean, at what point do we say, this is what the people want. We'll do our best. We're going to fight the good fight at the Pioneer Press and the Star Tribune. But we've got to lower our expectations. Uh, I don't have as much faith in the people as you do, Sandra. At least not right now. I am not a journalist. I am the people. <laughs> and <clears throat> when, and as a, but I'm a psychologist. I'm a research uh, social scientist. And I was trained to be as objective as possible in my research to try to disprove what I wanted to prove. And I think that the problem that I see now is proving what you want to see written rather than doing the work that needs to be done to disprove what it is you might have been told. So I think that is part of the problem is that for me, the news has become too sensationalized. I'd like to see it where there are opposing views presented in a way that questions what I'm reading and why, or at least moves me to ask an additional question from what has been written to get me to think about what has been presented, not that someone is telling me what is, but getting me to think about what is written. And so that is someone who's a reader. I still read the Pioneer Press. I still read the Star Tribune. I read the New York Times. I read all of those things. Matter of fact, get them online now. Uh, although I still like the New York Times and the hard copy on Sunday. Um, so I still do all of that kind of stuff. So I am not going to give up on what I think the, what journalists should do. I still want to believe in the news and believe in the people who are writing the stories. I don't think I'm alone in that regard. I don't think there's many, many of you left. I think there are all of you who are left. <laughs> I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking in the room and there are many of us left, but I, I want to believe because I still think that there's value in the news and presenting different perspectives to get those of us who want to think, I don't even read the, the um, blogs and all that other kind of stuff. I don't, because I don't trust it. I don't. I want something that I think has been researched, something where questions have been asked, and somebody's gone out and try and get the, get the data or get, at least get some objective framework. So I'm going to say, I, maybe I'm not typical in the people, but I hope I'm somewhat typical I hope, I in the people. There are more people like you than I think about. But, I mean, the Pioneer Press would be making 10 times the money it is now, right? You'd have a much bigger set if that was true. Well. Because you guys do offer what she's talking about. The Star Tribune does. But we're struggling. Yeah. There's a lot of news organizations that don't, that don't believe what you do or what we believe in are doing quite well. Sorry. You don't. But, but the people that have the money are. I think they're all, I mean, everybody's struggling because the marketplace got blown up by this explosion of freedom and explosion of other things too. And, and we're, we're yet to figure out, <clears throat> you know, what the mix is. You know, we've, we've always had a, we've had horoscopes forever and comics, you know, we've had all this bundle of things forever. But I, you know, I, I don't think of this as beating ourselves up. I think of it as the world is an interesting place and the more interested we are in it and the more we do to try to reflect that, the better off we're all going to be. So I, I, don't, I don't feel, I mean, there are discouraging things about the business, but, but I, don't, I don't feel that way. The other thing I would like to say is Jane Kirtley's point about, about being on your side, you know, is I think born out in in all kinds of ways, in the old ways and in some of the new ways. You know, in Jim's opening remarks, he referred to some of these new outfits that are doing pretty well. 
Well, I wonder what the thread that runs through them is. I guarantee you, it's not that news is a commodity. They're coming from somewhere. They're meant for somebody. You know, you look at, you look at say, Sahan Journal here. You know, Sahan Journal. It's a pretty interesting phenomenon. It is. And, you know, it's who knows how it's all going to go. But, right. but the idea that, that we're somewhere, we're for you, we're independent, we're going to be on your side, that's been a key element of every, every media business success, I think, that, that exists. It is at the Star Tribune for sure, you know, and, and we local people at St. Paul aim to make it that way too for the Pioneer Press. And so I, I you know, I don't feel, I, I feel worried and tired sometimes, you know, but I don't feel discouraged about the, the potential to connect with the people who want stuff they can trust because we did some research on it, you know. But I hear what you're saying. <laughs> I do. And you can see evidence for what you said, Neil, in some of the metrics. I, if our mission is to write for people like you, that's right. And we'll do it as, as, as long as, as we can and do it properly. But I think maybe we have to lower our expectations and what we what we think of what we hope people will write for us would, would, would be possible. Yeah, that may be. Every new cell phone I get gives me more weather. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Hamlin. Is this on? Yeah. Okay. I'm a Hamlin graduate, and I I actually have to agree very much with you. Could you bring the um, microphone a little closer to your? Yes. Is Thank that you. better? Sorry, I don't use these very often. No, it just needs to be um, louder. That's I understand, so it can record. Um, I just wanted to say that I, I very much agree with you on some of the points that you made. Um, my background, because I did graduate from Hamlin. I, um, I worked abroad for many, many years, and I actually had the privilege to work in Russia. And so I saw a very different side of things, but I saw that side and I've watched it for the last 30 years. And in the first 10 years, you would be shocked, and, and I'm sure you know this, but when I would watch TV at night, for the first 10 years, I saw both sides of the story, both sides. That's how some of these new channels that then got shut down in like 2002, 2003 time. In fact, in 2001, the biggest one got shut down. But um, it was amazing. I had never really come across that here in the States. There was, you know, investigative reporting and you did see both sides. But this was like, okay, they believe this and this is what's happened. They believe this and this is what's happened and then on this one channel you made up your own mind and that was probably quite dangerous but um, as I saw that evolve and now that I'm back here in the states I guess I have a question for you I, there's a lot of editors in this room and, and, and others that are very esteemed in the press what role do the owners of your institutions play in this? Because I can't help but remember seeing, I believe it was Murdoch, together with Trump in Scotland. And as soon as I saw that, I said, he's gonna be the next president. That's just what's gonna happen, and it was. And so how predictable does news become, I guess is my question. Um, to respond to what you were saying, um, Dr. Finesse Miller, um, yes, I think the, the press, because I, I did marketing and PR, I saw it from a bit of a different standpoint. I saw it from how I had to talk to my legal group to know what my spokespeople could actually say to the press, what word it was that hinged on the truth. And I think we all know what I'm talking about in this room, right? What word did that hinge on? So there's so many dynamics within it, but to have objective sides to both sides of the story is a beautiful thing. And I, I say, please don't lower your standards. Keep those standards as high as they should be because there are people out there that read it. And if it's not us, there are international people that read it. And they have already formed their opinion. So shock them instead in a good way, please. Thank you. I 
I wanted to add one more thing to when it, uh, the discussion about what gets traffic. I was exec, exec editor of WashingtonPost.com for many years, and there were a lot of stories that got 5,000 page views but got a mayor to resign. So it's not always about a story that gets a half a million page views. A lot of times those are junk stories that get picked up by Yahoo or Drudge Report, whatever, and it's not, it doesn't have any impact. And I think we can never forget that the goal of our publications is to have an impact. It's to actually change the world that we live in. And so something that gets, a, you know, a mayor who gets tossed out of office because they they embezzle some money that gets 5,000 page views, those are 5,000 well, and those are 5,000 important page views to get. And I think I don't want, we shouldn't lose sight of that because the business model for journalism is changing in digital now, and it's about membership. It's about getting people to give you money because they like what you do, and they give you money because you get the mayor, you bring the mayor down, not because you do a bunch of photo galleries. I, I had to live through that awful era of page views being everything, and we did crap journalism in a lot of cases to get those page views, and now you're not seeing that as much anymore because you got to make those readers hand over money because you are holding people accountable locally, and when you go to that city council meeting and that story gets 2,500 page views, maybe that's because nothing happened to that meeting because a journalist was in the room. And if a journalist wasn't in the room, you end up with Bell, California, where you got guys embezzling money for basically giving themselves crazy salary raises because nobody is in the room. So sometimes the price of that low page views is precisely there's a journalist there, and that kept something from happening, which is why the story's boring, and it gets 2,000 page views. <laughs> but that's, we're there for a reason, and sometimes I think we get, I don't want to get too caught up in page views, because I feel like that is, that is a currency that killed us for a long time early in the digital era, I would argue. Jane Prince, I would be really interested in your take on any of this. Jane is a city council member here in St. Paul, very thoughtful person. Uh, when you, when you consider the question of what can anybody do about the divide, what can media do about the polarization, from your angle of view, what comes to mind? Let's get you a microphone, Jane, for you. Wow. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. I guess I'm doing that today. I'm expecting to be called on. I, well, you know, of course, Mike, it's not lost on you that we're a one-party town. So, and I was at a, uh, some session about housing several years ago, and there was somebody talking about how they were from Burlington, Vermont, and they'd done a housing program. And oddly enough, the, the socialists were the ones who brought it forward through a coalition with the Republicans. And I was sitting with Andy Driscoll, who some of you may remember, but Andy and I turned to each other and said, isn't that funny? In St. Paul, we all call ourselves DFLers. But it was within that, we have our lefties. And now I'm the conservative on the council, which I never saw myself that way. Um, you know, today I heard Sandy on the radio with Jane and one of the things that, that I think Jane said was, um, were you the one or was it Kathy who said we don't teach civics anymore? Yeah, I mean, when I hear you talking about what we need to feel bad about, Sandy, in terms of being on the opposite side of how bad things are um, for free speech, I think one of the things that's really bad is that public education is not reaching kids to understand why they need to be interested or involved or how it might affect them. And just when I was sitting here, I remember, I think it was John, the founding father, John Adams, who said, the reason we need good education is so people understand what their rights are so they can fight for them. And um, I, <laughs> well, there it is. But, um, but I mean, I, th ethics. but I do think that's the problem with, with our, uh, the, the coming generations on the free speech question. I was so fascinated when Jeff talked about, you know, that millennials and younger don't mind that social media knows everything they do. 
um, I, I heard, I think it was a story on public radio about a year and a half or two years ago where they were doing man on the street interviews asking questions that didn't necessarily talk about the constitution but were formed around, you know, would you prefer a more authoritarian, I mean, it, they didn't use that word, but you know, would you rather that, that the leader of our country decided stuff and we didn't have to have all this fighting about it in Congress and, and the questions were all, all of the respondents were saying, yeah, that'd be way better. We just argue about things too much. We never get anything done. Look at gridlock. And so I'm worried about the future because I don't think we're teaching kids about the Constitution and about City Hall and about why they should be active and involved so they know enough to fight for something that at our age we value because it's free speech. I don't think that answered your question, Mike, but if I can say anything, I mean, about, about the Pioneer Press, those of us who used to be on the left, I was Andy Dawkins' campaign manager when he ran for mayor in 1993, and we all canceled our subscriptions to the Pioneer Press, um, as a, which probably didn't hurt you that much. <laughs> but, but I mean, at at the time, um, you know, the, the Andy ran against Norm Coleman, who had, in our view, a very cozy relationship with Peter Ritter, and that had been cultivated over the years that Jim Scheibel was mayor. And so I think, you know, over the years, the Pioneer Press has been a place where a lot of these politics really played out, and maybe not so much anymore. Um, and then the other thing was about why are we fighting over the, the county and the city over, uh, over downtown zoning? <laughs> I'll tell you, the county wants to build 60-story buildings, and we just went through COVID. And in case anybody didn't notice, people aren't coming back to downtown as quickly as we would like. So I would argue that the county's plan is a little out of step with where the country is going on central business districts. But also, we aren't doing enough planning downtown to know what we want our future downtown to be. So, but this has just been a great day, and I can't wait till tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Jim. I, I think you have reason to be to be worried and to be scared about the kids not. Yeah. I, I I think there's a lot to be worried about. Yeah. Okay. Just an observation, and first of all, since we're all calling out our Hamlin Street cred, class of 94, go Pipers, so <laughs> another alum. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm also not a journalist like Dr. Miller, but I um, did work in the NPR newsroom for a couple of years as a producer, and while I was there, I was introduced to a lovely term of art, which was called the news hole. And this, you know, I just had this vision of this, like, yawning, insatiable thing that was in front of us. And w one thing I've been hearing all day today is this evolution of the news hole that it used to be for us, it was minutes, it was words, right? We could define that news hole, then it became clicks, right? And it's like, and it, that talk about like infinite, how much news can you make? Well, I don't know, we'd like infinite clicks and now it's impact, right? But my question is like, has that, has that changed? Has demand changed? Is everyone now distracted and they're looking at TikTok and they don't really care what's going on? Do young people say, you know, whatever, the world's going to hell and I'm just gonna have fun? Or has the news hole actually gotten bigger? And is that why we've seen these part, you know, the rise of more partisan news? Because they're just trying to fill it with, with this content that well, people really want. Online, the news hole is unlimited. So that's a whole different matter. So in that sense, the bigger the news hole, the more junk it, it, it can take. And I, it's not all junk by any means. But maybe the critical facility is, the standard is lowered sometimes. And I'm not talking about these really important new digital news sources, which I think the Min Post is one of them. Sahan Journal is certainly one of them. I don't know enough about the local media scene. 
But I'm talking about, you know, some of the ridiculous years. I mean, the notion that a substantial amount of the American public gets its information and forms its opinions on the basis of things that it reads on what used to be called Twitter and is now called X. I think it's a great new name for Twitter because <laughs> it implies there's nothing there. Um, is horrifying. It's absolutely horrifying. It's a, it's a good question, and it's, I, I think it's another way of making the point that Neil was making, you know, because there, there is a great degree of this that's not our fault. You know, and that we maybe can't do anything about, and so how do we find how do we find the current again? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Just one other thing that that I just thought of is, city government worked much better when there were a lot of reporters in the press room, mm -hmm. and that is that has not been the case since I've been back. I mean, when I worked in the Latimer administration. And then through the, the Norm Coleman administration, the press room, there were reporters in the press room on days other than Wednesday. And um, so I, I think that's a real loss. And, and, and for me, I love local government because it's where it's all really personal and where you can really get things done for people and, and make a difference. Um, so I think, we really miss the newspapers and the local media in City Hall. Just to back that up, and Mike, you know this better than anybody, the most expensive commodity, at the most ex biggest expense in traditional newsrooms is reporters. It is expensive to have good reporters, and we're not making the money we, we were because there's not enough Dr. Millers around. There's not enough people that are supporting us. Um, and so, again, I, I, if people were interested in the things you're talking about enough, Mike would hire, Mike could sell enough papers that he could hire five more reporters. Um, these local communities that have no news, as somebody said before, where city councils and school boards are getting away with murder, they would be in business if people were, were buying them. Um, and just to get back on, I could talk about Fox all day because I just think it's fascinating. But another thing to look at at Fox that they've done very well is rely on commentators rather than investigative reporting. If you watch Fox, and please, I mean, do, it's fascinating. Yeah, I know, I saw that before. Yeah, oh, they show that stuff all the time. And uh, if you watch Fox, they will talk a lot about why is the mainstream media covering Hunter Biden? Why aren't they investigating Hunter Biden and his tying with, with Joe Biden? First of all, Fox is the mainstream media. And second of all, why don't you investigate Hunter Biden? And they don't because, as Mike knows, uh, investigative reporting is extremely expensive. And you may report something for eight months, a year. It doesn't go anywhere. And it's much cheaper to have Laura Ingram complain about nobody covering it. Um, that's right. It might not go the way you think it is. That's right. I mean, one of the best pieces of investigative reporting in the last four or five years was the New York Times piece on Trump's tax history and where he really got his money from. Um, fantastic piece. I think it ran, what, 30 pages or something. I don't know how many people read it. Well, there you go. <laughs> See, if everybody was like Dr. Mill, we'd be in... Mike and I would be making $20,000 more a year. Um, but um, Fox does not do investigative reporting. They mostly complain about other people. Some of their complaints are justified, and it's, it's a lot cheaper, right? And just one last thing on the young people thing. Young people never cared about the news. I mean, we talk about this all the time. Why? The numbers, okay. The reason why I say this is really You need a microphone. Part of my research over the years has been on political attitudes of adolescents. That's what I did most of my academic career, doing that research. And we make the assumption that young people don't care about it when in fact they do. What they, what they have issues with is the way we report it. Not so much that 
and, and, and they, I, I, and this gets back to that idea of objectivity. They don't see, they don't see the news as necessarily objective or see themselves in the news. That's what I discovered in some of my research. But if you, I mean, I mean I'll, I'll just go back when I was doing some of my research, which when Reagan, well, that's the question. That is a question. But in terms of more than one side being presented. It is, but that is one of the, yes. But it's also, in my opinion, is that you're not imposing your own beliefs and opinions over what is written. That to me. Yes, yes. So I'm so I think that's that's what I'm because when when I first started doing this research, I was a a young student at Yale University working with Bob Abelson, who's one of the foremost social psychologists in the nation. And at that time, Reagan had made some decisions to decrease the amount of federal aid going to students. That was an issue that young people cared about. And they rallied around it. They were, they were on it. There was all kinds of attitudes and behaviors going on. So I know when the issue is something they care about and is reported in a way that they can wrap their hands around it, you get a different response. I will also say this, in, 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 in Hammond University, among the top students in the nation for voting, in the nation. So there are young people out there who are still paying attention to this stuff. It may not be as many as you like, but they're paying attention. So I don't wanna, I don't wanna, I don't wanna sort of put all young people in the same category. Remember those young people came out of Florida when the shooting occurred and they got behind gun control or the stuff they're doing now on climate control? There's some, some topics that young people care about that maybe we need to focus more on. I'll just give a quick response. I know that it's getting late, but I, when there's an issue that young people care about, the Vietnam War, young people cared about that very much. The, the issue is how do we sustain young people on a daily basis where they're checking out the news, they're watching the nightly news like adults used to, they're subscribing to a newspaper. I don't think there's ever been an era in newspapers where young people subscribe to a newspaper or watched Walter Cronkite. I think there's this fantasy that kids were, I, I think I've read before, and you guys might know the answer, that it's not until you have kids and you buy a house that you get into the daily cycle of reading a responsible reading thing. But you're right, individual issues, um, young people will get excited about, but if they don't have traditional place to go that's trusted and is gonna give them news when they're not interested, but should be, that we've had that problem for since the beginning of time. Neil, you know, one of the reasons that young people got so mobilized on the Vietnam War and the civil rights movement in more or less the same era was the fact that the political system was failing utterly to look at dissenting views to, to raise them. I mean, you know, Hubert Humphrey, to use a Minnesota example, didn't dare oppose the Vietnam War publicly, even though he had already changed his mind about it. Yeah, but that was a long time coming. Yeah, so the political system was utterly in complete gridlock then, and not because people were disagreeing too much, because people weren't expressing dissenting views at all. And so it took the kids in the streets and the media to provide meaningful opposition. And that was a very, that was a very invigorating, well, yeah, that was a very invigorating thing though. I think we've uh, covered a lot, stirred up, this topic over? Stirred up some <laughs> dust. And uh, thank you for those who stayed on. Thank you, Mike. <laughs>